Hi everyone, my name is Jalit George and I will be presenting over rubella. Here are some quick facts about the illness. So some common names for rubella include the three-day measles and German measles. Uh, we refer to it as the three-day measles mostly because um, it is a less severe case of the better known measles illness. Um, it usually only lasts about three days, so that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, and then we refer to it as the German measles, uh, mostly because it was first described and um, discovered by a bunch of German physicians. It is important to note that rubella is not the same thing as measles. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, rubella is a milder form of measles, and you can easily remember that by remembering what MMR vaccine stands for. Um, it stands for measles, mumps, and rubella vaccine. So by knowing that, you automatically also know that rubella and measles are two separate um, and distinct illnesses. So a brief history. To begin, in 1740, German physician Friedrich Hoffmann was the first one to actually describe the illness. In 1814, George de Matten was the first one to recognize the disease um, as distinct from both scarlet fever and measles. And because they were both German, they both referred to the illness as Rotlin. Um, I believe that's how you pronounce it, but um, the gist of it is that because this was so hard for most others to pronounce, in 1866, British surgeon Henry Vale was the first one to coin the term rubella in place of Rotlin. Um, and rubella was basically just Latin for little red. Uh, evidently, he was referring to the little red rashes that you can um, see on an infected person. Um, this is characteristic of the illness. Uh, in 1914, Alfred Fabian Hess was the first one to identify that the infection was caused by a virus. Uh, this was later confirmed in 1938, and in 1962, both Paul D. Parkman and Thomas H. Weller were the first to isolate the virus for further study. In order to dig deeper into this causative agent, uh, we should first begin by understanding that it falls under this broad generic category of arboviruses. Arboviruses are basically viruses or vectors that are arthropod born. Um, and that's where the arbo part of arbovirus comes in. Uh, they're broken down into three different categories. Category one consists of the toga viruses, Category 2 consists of the flavivirus, and category 3 consists of the um, bunyavirus, bunyaviruses and the arenaviruses. But we really don't need to worry about the second and third categories because our causative agent uh, falls in the family of Togaviridae. Within that family, we have two different genuses. First, we have the alpha virus, and um, the sec secondly, we have the rubavirus. And within that rubavirus, there is only one member. So uh, the only species that exists within the rubavirus just so happens to be our causative agent, otherwise known as the rubavirus rubella. And I know that I said that it falls under this broad category known as, um, broad group known as arboviruses. However, the rubavirus is the exception. It is the only toga virus that's actually not an arthropod-borne vector. In fact, transmission of this virus is usually via um, respiratory droplets, but we will go more into that later. Uh, this right here is a structure of the rubella virus. Um, as you can see, it is part of group four of the Baltimore classification system. And all this genomic material that you see right here um, is basically just positive sense, single-stranded RNA. Um, it's surrounded by this isometric icosahedral nucleocapsid. Um, there is a nuclear envelope made up of a lipid bilayer membrane, which of course comes from the host cells membrane. Um, and then from that, you can see that there are these spike-like hemagglutinin glycoprotein projections from the surface. Um, and so, yeah, this is what the rubella virus structure basically looks like. Um, the size of the virus varies from somewhere between 40 to 80 nanometers. 
Um, entry of the virus into the host cell happens via endocytosis. Multiplication or replication happens in the cytoplasm of the infected host cell. And this is mainly because um, this virus is a positive ssRNA. If it was a DNA, then it would probably replicate in the nucleus as opposed to the cytoplasm. Um, and then exit of the virus happens um, through secretion by exocytosis or apoptosis, in which case the host cell would just die. Um, this is, again, just a rundown of what I just explained. So first you have the um, RNA virus entering the host cell through endocytosis, and then you have viral replication um, in the cytoplasm of the host cell, and then the host cell um, undergoes lysis or breaks down, um, and you have the virus being released through exocytosis secretions. Transmission of the virus primarily um, happens uh, through the air. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, there um, this isn't and this isn't quite this isn't quite an arbovirus because. Um, most of the transmissions happen through respiratory droplets that are present in the air. So when an infected person coughs or sneezes, they're releasing that um, respiratory droplet um, of that virally infected particle into the air, and then the non-infected or uninfected person breathes that in and then suddenly becomes infected. That's how airborne secretions occur. Um, and you can also have direct person-to-person -person contact. Um, I know this looks misleading. This probably looks like the direct contact that I'm referring to, but it's that's not really what goes on. Um, because it requires respiratory secretions, um, examples would include sharing food or drinks or kissing or something that include in, that involves direct contact um, through of uh, respiratory organs. Um, yeah, okay, and then you also have congenital transmission. Which, um, um, in order, okay, in order to understand that, first you have to understand that the rubella virus is a, is a teratogenic agent, which means that it um, can disrupt the development of an embryo or fetus. This happens when a non-immune pregnant woman um, suddenly becomes infected by rubella. This is what you call acquired rubella. This usually happens when she's in direct contact with a child um, who is also affected. Um, and then she, um, the virus goes through her respiratory route and then eventually reaches her placenta and then it transplacentally um, passes on to her unborn child or fetus via her bloodstream. Um, so that's how you can, that's how the baby can get congenital rubella syndrome. And this is very bad. This is actually the most dangerous aspect of rubella, mostly because it can cause severe birth defects in the baby and just uh, make life very tough for that poor child. So acquired rubella. Um, again, it occurs through the respiratory route. So first off, um, replication occurs in the nasopharynx and lymph nodes. Once the virus, once the rubella virus is replicated there, it gains access to the lymphatic system and then it enters the bloodstream. So viremia um, is that it stays in the blood for about five to seven days after infection. And during this time period, it spreads to other target organs. And you can see this, um, and this is more evident by the rashes spreading from uh, the face to the chest to the rest of the body. Incubation period is roughly two to three weeks. This means that um, it takes two to three weeks for um, an infected person to finally start showing symptoms. Uh, hallmark symptoms include reddish or pinkish rashes, as you can see on this person right here. Um, it first appears behind the uh, ears, around the neck and on the face, and then it spreads to the chest, arms, legs, and the rest of the body. Um, secondary symptoms include lymphadenopathy, low-grade fever, uh, conjunctivitis, which is just pink eye, malaise, and your usual ca case of stuffy or runny nose. Lymphadenopathy is just um, enlargement or swelling of the lymph nodes. 
So as you can see right here, um, this is the swelling that I was referring to of the lymph nodes. Um, and you can also see some pinkness right there. That would be where like the rashes first began, like I mentioned earlier. Um, and then there's also more pinkness and more rashes right there. Um, and then in CRS, uh, you first, it first starts with the mom being infected via the respiratory route. She um, gets acquired rubella and then she transplacentally uh, passes that on to her unborn um, baby. If this occurs in the first trimester of the pregnancy, then there's an 85% chance that the um, child that's born will have congenital defects like cataracts, growth retardation, encephalitis, microcephaly, uh, purpura, heart disease, uh, deafness, and so much more. Uh, again, this, these are just more examples of um, um, all the different organ systems that can be targeted by CRS. So you can have glaucoma, so that would just be the ocular system. Um, you can have congenital heart disease. Uh, you can even like be deaf. Uh, so yeah. Okay, this right here is just pathogenesis um, of the disease. So it's basically everything that I've explained so far. You have the rubella virus being developed in the nasopharynx. Um, and then it goes through the respiratory tract, and you can that you can see that through um, symptoms like coughs and minor sore throats. Um, and then when you see rashes or lesions, you know that the virus is affecting uh, the skin. And when you see swelling of the lymph nodes, you know that that's lymphadenopathy. Um, and I didn't mention this earlier, but um, when you have arthritis or aching pain in your joints, you know that the lymph or the virus has like reached your joints and has started affecting the cells there. Um, and then when the virus transplacentally moves on to the fetus, you um, see that it has a much more severe consequence. Uh, the, there's fetal damage, uh, there can be mental or growth retardation, and many of the other um, um, effects that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so more information about the disease. So in children or adults who acquire rubella, uh, these they can be contagious from about seven days before the onset of the rash to uh, up to seven days after the, after the rash disappears. So like one week before to one week after the appearance of the rash. Um, Infants, on the other hand, who have CRS are actually more contagious. They're contagious for up to a year, and they can pass on the illness through uh, their urine or through um, respiratory secretions, uh, for example, mucus from the nose or throat. Um, and then stats from 1964 to 1965, a pre-vaccination period, show that there were about 12.5 million cases of rubella, 20,000 of which were CRS, um, 11,600 being deafness, um, and then you have examples of blindness, mental retardation, spontaneous miscarriages, um, and neonatal death, which is just death immediately after birth. Um, of course, vaccination improved um, things significantly. Uh, the first rubella vaccine was developed and, admis and administered in 1969. And then by 1971, they were able to make a combo vaccination um, known as the MMR vaccine, which uh, vaccinated against measles, mumps, and rubella. Um, if you're vaccinated with MMR, then you are about 95% protected from the virus. However, they do recommend two doses for children. So the first dosage would ideally occur from 12 to 15 months of age and the second one from four to six years of age. It um, happens via subcutaneous injection. Um, and you can also get the MMRV, which is also vaccinates against chickenpox. Um, this is just a little flyer showing the importance of the MMR shot. Um, so basically, um, the uh, rubella virus has been eradicated from the Americas since 2004, but worldwide eradication will take time. The WHO recognizes that, but our next goal is to eradicate it from other regions like Southeast Asia and Africa. And that concludes my presentation. Thank you. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask.